Hey, uh, welcome back. We just read from Acts 21. So I'll go ahead and uh, summarize a few important points from this section. So we are looking at uh, Paul traveling out of Miletus. And then, as I told us, you know, there are, there are those names, Kos, Rhodes, Patara. And uh, through a ship, they sail to uh, Phoenicia. And then, uh, you know, they, they passed uh, through Cyprus and they sailed to Syria, Tyre, if you remember. And uh, then the ship finally, you know, was un un ship unloaded her cargo. And then uh, there were some disciples even in this place in uh, Tyre. So that shows us that by now there are disciples in a lot of cities, towns. So when Luke is saying there were some disciples in this region also, uh, that means by, uh, you know, the gospel has gone there and uh, people are already believing there were disciples. So that's a beautiful thing. Wherever Paul is going now, uh, already there are people who believe. Uh, thank God there was a culture of hospitality among the believers. So he was hosted in that place. Um, and uh, these uh, disciples also had a heart for Paul. They must have heard about Paul uh, or even, you know, they, they may have come to the school of Tyrannus where uh, Paul ministered uh, for uh, an extended period of time. So this is how the connection was, uh, was like, was probably formed. And uh, uh, in this place called Tyre, he was able to have a, a proper stopover. But while he was there, we are told the disciples of this place, they had a word for Paul. So what is that word? So they're telling Paul, please don't go to Jerusalem. We already know Paul said that chains await me when he talked to the Ephesians. Uh, he knew that something is going to happen if he goes to Jerusalem. Now, by revelation, there are other people who are telling Paul the same thing. What are they saying? Uh, there are problems. There are dangers in Jerusalem, Paul. So please don't go there. However, uh, he is moving towards that same place. Why do you think Paul is doing this? He also knew that there are problems. And uh, here are the disciples telling him, don't go. Any idea why he's still moving uh, towards uh, Jerusalem? We see later on that you know they all prayed together and they sent him off further ahead on his journey so uh, he didn't obey or he didn't respond to the word of warning given by these disciples uh, why do you think it was so any idea maybe he just wanted to do the will of god that's right so uh but people have a revelation, isn't it? People have, uh, by revelation, told him, don't go. Then uh, how come, like, is it the will of God for him to go when God is revealing that there is a problem? Yes. Okay. Because, because even if they were having those revelations, we, uh, we only have the uh, part of the story. He also might have had the same, he would also have had a different, the same revelation, but again, the spirit telling him, you must go complete this, just like we see Jesus Christ having been, exactly. uh, had a cup. Uh. Exactly, exactly. So when we consider the prophetic, um, there are all kinds of revelations that God gives us. Something regarding the future is communicated to us so that we may escape it. But then there are things which are communicated to us regarding the future, uh, which may help us prepare ourselves. So just because there was a revelation to these disciples that Paul is going to encounter difficulty in Jerusalem, it did not mean that God was telling him not to go. In fact, uh, his resolve got stronger and he knew that he has to face this. There's no other way. So he was moving in the same direction. So that's something that we observe. So thank you for uh, your views. As he went ahead from this uh, place, uh, you know, he goes into the region of Caesarea. Now, Caesarea, if you recall, 
in acts 8 uh, we had a man known as philip who went to you know samaria and then uh, he came up to the ethiopian eunuch to minister uh, on the road uh, to gaza so this particular person philip he was one of the seven volunteers chosen in acts chapter 6 uh, he lives in caesarea now the introduction to philip as per luke is philip the evangelist so uh, another thought regarding this particular uh, introduction in acts 8 there is no philip the evangelist but in acts 21 he is introduced as acts uh, the philip the evangelist so it tells us something about the way we move ahead in the call of god so when god calls us and we begin to do the work that he calls us to do there may not be titles names associated with the work that we are doing and we must not worry too much about it we must be faithful to the work that god is calling us to do so when philip started uh, nobody called him an evangelist whereas he was doing the work of an evangelist so faithfully when uh, the work in samaria was uh, successful peter and john heard about it and they came they started to take it forward uh, he went and philip heard the word of the lord uh, he was so attuned to the voice of the holy spirit that he went to an influential person the ethiopian eunuch and uh, as we discussed at that point the gospel went to africa so mighty things were done through his life but you know it it's nice to see that uh, he was not seeking any recognition or any titles he was just doing a good work faithfully but now that he has served for years uh, we understand that he was recognized as an evangelist okay so that's a lesson for us because uh, the titles will come later titles may come later uh, and we should not worry about it and titles are just to to uh, reveal the function that god has called us to but look at this one is about the ministry of philip and how he has grown in the ministry and how he is now well recognized as an evangelist another thing is about the family of philip so what about his family we are told that he had four virgin daughters and they prophesied so uh, he seems to have brought up his children uh, in the ways of the lord he seems to have brought up his children with uh, the teaching and the exposure to uh, the power of god so he was also a man who was flowing in the supernatural you know he heard the voice of the holy spirit he got transported so so many things uh, happened supernaturally in philip's life look at look at his daughters now they prophesied it says so obviously uh, he taught his uh, children as well and uh, his daughters are flowing in prophecy Another thought here is uh, the daughters are prophesying. So any thoughts about that? Daughters are prophesying in the book of Acts. Is it okay for daughters to prophesy? Any scripture references for that? Women prophesying. Joel 2.28. Yes, correct. And which, which uh, you know, Peter quotes in Acts chapter 2, where he says, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. So there is a fulfillment of what was spoken early on in the book of Acts. The daughters of Philip are prophesying. Uh, they were not the only women who were prophesying, but, uh, you know, we know that there must have been many others. However, uh, there is an evidence to the fulfillment of what God had told early in the book of Acts. So that is nice to note. Uh, so uh, the daughters are prophesying. And at the same time, when Paul is in Philip's house, there comes a prophet Agabus. Have you heard about this man earlier? Anytime? Have we heard his name in the book of Acts? 
recalling is the best way to learn that's why i'm asking you agabus where did you read about agabus exactly so agabus in the ministry uh, at antioch yeah antioch of syria agabus had come he was the one who prophesied that there's going to be a famine and in accordance with that prophetic word uh, relief was was planned for jerusalem so that's the same prophet so he's a very well known prophet he's a very well accepted uh, prophet who comes to visit as well and uh, it was through agabus that god reconfirmed the word that paul already knew the word that the disciples in uh, tyre spoke about and now agabus is telling paul what is what is he doing he takes the belt of paul and he binds his hands and feet and agabus says thus says the holy spirit so shall the jews at jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the gentiles so the prophetic word is saying paul you are going to be caught when you go to jerusalem so clear cut already god is telling paul are you ready for this okay uh, we we just said that the reason why god is revealing this is so that paul's heart can be prepared that he has to face all these difficulties you know uh, and uh, whether he is so determined and committed uh, that he is willing to go through these difficulties and that's the reason sometimes god tells us beforehand uh, about certain challenges as well that we may uh, encounter as we are serving him so uh, agabus tells him about this now when agabus also reveals the same thing uh, look at this the hearts of these brothers were such that or people were such that they did not want paul to face any difficulty okay they all loved one another uh, and so they are telling him they are pleading with him it says verse 12 they are pleading with him not to go to jerusalem but what is paul saying paul is saying see don't cry and break my heart okay that emotional uh, uh, you know uh, moment that he is not able to see them crying but he tells them that he is ready not only to be bound uh, in jerus bound but to die at jerusalem for the name of the lord jesus christ so that is so powerful you know, paul uh, has come to a place of completely surrendering his life to god to the extent that even though he knows uh, that you know uh, he has to face uh, being imprisoned he's ready for that and even to die okay so uh, notice as i said earlier when the disciples had stated that paul you are going to face dangers he was still moving ahead in that same direction now a great prophet agabus is coming and telling him he's still moving in the same direction so uh, the prophetic word was only meant to prepare him not to stop him from moving ahead to jerusalem okay now uh, another point that we can notice here is the way the prophetic word is presented so in the city uh, or in the region of uh, tyre they told him that uh, these problems await you uh, but the presentation of the prophetic word by agabus how does he do it you know it's very dramatic so sometimes the presentation of the prophetic word can just be like you know you say it uh, Uh, this is what i sense god is saying or it can be an action so in this case it's an action he takes the belt of paul he binds himself and he says uh, this is going to happen to the man to whom this belt belongs so we find a demonstration of the prophetic word uh, done in creative ways uh, in the form of uh, you know actions in some parts of scripture so that is also uh, a manner in which we can actually present the 
prophetic word. So it all depends on how the Holy Spirit is guiding us to present the prophetic word. So, uh, so far, we've understood that, uh, you know, Paul is moving towards Jerusalem. Something terrible is awaiting him over there. He knows it. His heart is ready to face it. And uh, that's where we are headed. All the brothers who love him, all the brethren uh, in, in the body of Christ, uh, they are feeling the pain. But what to do? You know, Paul has to undergo this. And so uh, he goes ahead. So now we are in that portion where he has come to Jerusalem. And uh, this whole situation is going to unfold. So let's read about it. We are at verse 15. Um, and we could go ahead and read till verse 25. So we'll read this section and then we will go to the next section where he's actually in the temple and he's caught. So Acts 15 to uh, Acts 21, verse 15 to verse 25. I think, uh, yeah. Okay, yes, Jeffy. Yeah. Acts chapter 15 was, uh, sorry, Acts chapter 21 mm -hmm. was 15 to 25. And after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain nation of Cyprus, Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. When he had greeted them, he told and detailed those things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be, be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they informed concerning you are nothing, but you but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. Yes, thank you, Jafina. So uh, now we see that he is in Jerusalem and uh, he comes to meet the disciples over there. We also read about uh, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce that, nation of uh, Cyprus. It says an early disciple. Okay, So this person, uh, when it says an early disciple, most likely they are referring to uh, this person being from the generation that saw Jesus. And uh, then continuing, like, you know, those those people who uh, followed Jesus and his teaching, uh, and then, you know, they would have they would have continued with the teaching of the apostles and been a part of uh, uh, the, the church in that sense. So early disciple means that. So he he's probably from the times of Jesus uh, and he must have been an older uh, individual now. He's also part of the team. And uh, when they finally come to Jerusalem and meet the brethren, there's always a reporting session or an update session. So Paul is sharing with them about all the things with James. Remember, James, James, the leader of the church. So uh, earlier, there was a James who was killed. But uh, now we're talking about James, the brother of Jesus, who is heading up uh, or who is the main person uh, who who's leading the church and uh, 
we talked about James in Acts chapter 15 when we uh, had the Jerusalem Council coming together. So he still is providing leadership to the church. Uh, and, uh, you know, Paul comes, reports all matters to him and all the elders present there. And uh, in detail, you know, he, he shares about these matters. Now, uh, it is brought up to Paul. They're happy about the reports, but they uh, they bring one issue to Paul. Okay, and what is that issue? They say that uh, look, Paul, uh, it is noted uh, that you know you you. Uh, I'll just read the statement. I think that will be better. Okay, verse twenty one. But they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, nor to walk according to the customs. So from the time of that uh, uh, Jerusalem Council, some rumors have spread, though it was decreed declared clearly to the people. Uh, the rumors now say that Paul is going around teaching Jews not to circumcise their children. Okay, Whereas that's not what was told in that. The Gentiles were instructed. Uh, they were told that you don't need to be circumcised in order to receive salvation, but you need to follow certain practices of godly living. So, you know, don't eat uh, food offered to idols or uh, 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 like, you know, strangled animals and uh, things like that. So there were instructions that were given to the Gentiles, but rumors they've they've kind of mixed up the whole story and the word is going around that paul is teaching the jews to forsake moses okay uh, so now because the image of paul is uh, uh, tainted by this rumor the assembly or the leaders give him one idea so they say uh, why not paul you take four men okay with you uh, and uh, take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they are informed concerning you are nothing but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law so why this custom or this practice being suggested by the elders simply because they want the others to uh, note paul as a devout jew also so they're just encouraging him to keep some customs so that the Jews will be able to relate with him. See, now Paul has been preaching to the Jews. He's also in some places. He got so upset and he went straight to the Gentiles. Okay, the Jews are not listening. Let's go to the Gentiles. So there are Gentile believers that he's working with. There are some Jewish believers who are who are uh, uh, his followers. Uh, but this this uh, rumor that just because he's a preacher to the Gentiles, he's not adhering to the laws of Moses has to be broken. And for that sake, the elders give him this idea. You just keep a Jewish custom, Paul. And when you keep the Jewish custom, what will happen? People will recognize that, oh, Paul also honors the Jewish uh, customs. He is a Jew like us. And, uh, you know, he he's not saying that we uh, one must... Uh, or, or let go of all the practices that the Jews have. So that's the point they're trying to make. Okay. Uh, now, just for the sake of, uh, you know, breaking this, this rumor or this image that he has, he is ready to go ahead with the suggestion of the elders. Okay. So now Paul goes to the temple with those four men, of course. But unfortunately, in the temple, uh, they they there is an uproar okay uh now i don't know if paul expected that uh, he would be uh, he would be caught immediately or it might take some time before all those prophetic words uh, are fulfilled but it's happening it's happening right away so when he goes to the temple there is again a misunderstanding about uh, paul and the and people are looking at him as somebody who does not uphold jewish uh, customs or you know jewish traditions so let's see what happens okay uh, if if someone is able to read it you could kindly read otherwise you know i'll only read it verse 26 all the way till uh, verse 36 How about uh, Rosalind? Are you able to read it? Uh, 
Yes, yes, yeah. Verse 26. Then Paul took the men, and the next day, having been purified with them, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the days of purification, at which at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. Now, when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar, he immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when he could not ascertain the truth, because of the tumult, he commanded him to be taken into the barracks. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, away with him. Should I continue? Uh, I, I think you can uh, stop, Rosalind. We can talk about this and then we can continue. So thank you so okay. much. Thank you. All right. So um, what we've seen is, as I was sharing, there's an image that Paul is not an upholder of the Jewish traditions. So, excuse me, even though he keeps that uh, um, custom of purification and he's going to the temple uh, for uh, seven days, people who had noticed him in the city with an uh, an Asian, okay, an Ephesian. Uh, they again, these are all hearsay. So nothing is nothing is uh, concrete. They just made up this this uh, rumor once again that he had brought him into the temple. Now, for the Jews, the temple is a very holy and a sacred place, and uh, they were not allowed to defile it. So, on the basis of this rumor that Paul has done it, uh, they they started to kind of, you know, let people know and uh, all the Jews got angry. And, you know, we, we see in verse 30, the whole city was disturbed. And then Paul was actually seized and dragged him out of the temple. So this incident takes place when he's in the temple. How sad. He's gone there to worship. He's gone there to, to fulfill those uh, rituals of purification. And in the midst of that, he is caught. He is dragged, and there is this whole uh, disorderly crowd, uh, you know, trying to hurt Paul and all of that. Now, remember, I mentioned earlier that in in the uh, Roman Empire, if things go wrong like this, then you would have the uh, uh, Roman authorities come in, and they would uh, that local leadership they would they would kind of. Uh, take away the the powers from them and uh, so an uproar was not at all a good thing which is why when the authorities the commander of the garrison uh, heard that this this is going on this unruly behavior is going on uh, in the temple in and around the temple he immediately took soldiers there because he needs to bring a calm he needs to bring peace so he goes there and uh, what they do is they uh, kind of rescue paul they uh, stop when when they saw, uh, wait, they saw the commander and and uh, the soldiers. The people stopped beating Paul, and then uh, what happens is they they take him 
remember the prophecy uh, each time chains await you and then agabus said that uh, you will be bound like this so verse 33 is where we actually see it happening we see that uh, the commander he took him he came near him they they took him and then he commanded for Paul to be bound with two chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. So the commander does not even know what has happened, just that this unruly crowd has to be brought under control. That was his uh, intention. And so Paul is now taken. Okay, And uh, there still continues to be uh, a lot of uh, a chaos. The multitude is, uh, you know, uh, or, or the people, the crowds are still crying out and you know they are upset with Paul because of what they have heard but it's not true okay but who is who is there to um, uh, find out or investigate this matter we'll see so the matter actually has to go into investigation uh, which is what will happen as we proceed from chapter 21 throughout like uh, you'll see chapter 22 23 uh, it's all about investigating uh, Paul now whether he really is this this Jew who is uh, not keeping the customs, who is defiant uh, of the the Jewish traditions and the Jewish beliefs, that's the question that people will ask. People will also ask whether he is breaking the laws of the land. Okay, so the interrogation needs to go on. So as of now, what has happened from the crowds? The commander took him away, and uh, uh, you know he is in custody. Okay, and now he, the the remaining of what happens actually begins to unfold. So let's read on. Let's read from uh, verse thirty-five. So again, let's just read from verse thirty-five, and let's read till verse forty. Verse thirty-five. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob, for the multitude of the people followed after, crying out, away with him. Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, may I speak to you? He replied, can you speak Greek? Are you not the Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great silence, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, Okay, thank you, Rosalind. So mm -hmm. the chapter ends here. Uh, what we've noticed is uh, while he is still there, um, he was about to be led into the to the barracks, but while he is still there, he wants to make use of the opportunity. So he asks the commander, and uh, he says, "You know, may I speak?" Uh, the commander uh, thinks of him. Again, he has his own imagination. So he thinks that Paul is some Egyptian who's led uh, rebels in, into the wilderness. But you see, no, none of that is confirmed. But people are acting on the basis of some imagination. Uh, but thankfully, the commander gives him an opportunity to speak as he introduces himself. So now we will see why did... Paul take up this opportunity to speak. You know what? What is going to come out of this? Uh, so he will begin to share. Now, Acts twenty-two, as we read, he's giving a description of himself and uh, an explanation to the people. But in that explanation, also we see who Paul is and what are the different things that have happened in his life so as we read you know there will be you, we might find that there is really uh, a repetition some some sections of what happened he's going to repeat it but a picture of his life will be painted okay so remember that yes there will be an explanation that no i am not who you think i am i have not done what you think i have done but at the same time there will be bits and pieces 
talking about Paul's life and his personality and all of that. So uh, we'll begin to read from Acts chapter 22 and verse 1. Maybe I will uh, just read it for us. Uh, it says, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when uh, they had they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. So uh, he spoke in which language? Hebrew language. That was familiar for them. So they were comfortable. They were listening to him. And then he said, I am indeed a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law and was zealous toward God as you all are, are today. Remember, we mentioned that his hometown is uh, Tarsus of Cilicia, but he is a scholarly man who was taught by Gamaliel. Do you remember Gamaliel? Back early uh, chapters of uh, Acts, he says, if this is a work of God, we cannot stop it. But if it's the work of man, then it will automatically cease. So that is the Gamaliel who was so well respected. Now, Paul says he's a student of Gamaliel. So uh, what does it tell us about his uh, life and his upbringing? He was very well-read, well-trained, scholarly individual and uh, zealous toward God. So he's a zealous, uh, you know, Pharisee. That's who Paul was. Uh, and he says, I persecuted this way. What is the way? What, do you remember the way? Okay. So... When we see Paul goes to um, persecute people, he takes letters to imprison you know, both men and women. At that point, we read that he was against the people of the, it's called the way. So they were not necessarily called you know, Christians or the church or by those terms. But uh, the unbelievers identified them as the people who followed this, this uh, way the way. So that's what he's saying. So I persecuted the way to the death, binding and delivering into prisons, both men and women. As also the high priest bears me witness and all the council of the elders from whom I also received letters to the brethren and went to Damascus to bring in chains, even those who were there to Jerusalem to be punished. Okay. So till verse five, we already know it's just a repetition of, uh, you know, Acts nine, whatever happened there. Now coming to verse 6, now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me indeed saw the light and were afraid, but when but they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go into Damascus. And there you will be told all things which are appointed for you to do. And since I could not see the glory of that light, being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. Okay, that's the end of verse 11. All this is self-explanatory. We've already seen these things take place. Now verse 12, then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood and said to me, brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour, I looked up at him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash your wash away your sin, sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So even this, we are familiar with. So verse 17 now. Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then 
he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. So Paul is giving an explanation of how his journey started and the call that God gave him and uh, the fact that he knew that it is going to be hard. He uh, he He's a devout Jew, yes. And that's what he's trying to explain. He's saying, I was brought up under the training of Gamaliel. I persecuted the way. And he's also saying, I gave consent to the people who were killing Stephen. So that's the kind of Jew I am. Okay, If you're questioning my Jewishness, uh, that's the kind of Jew that I am. But then uh, he also says that, he God had already told him that people will find it so difficult to accept his message, you know, after his conversion. Uh, and uh, God, it was God who told him that he needs to go to the Gentiles. Okay, so basically he's saying, God called me, God wanted me to minister to the Jews, but I understood that the Jews will not be receiving of this. So I also have a call to go to the Gentiles. So the moment he says Gentiles, you know, the Jews had a thing uh, against the Gentiles. So that kind of, uh, you know, till now they're listening because he's narrating a story. He's speaking in Hebrew. It's quite acceptable to him. But the moment he says Gentiles, things go, you know, the wrong way. So from verse 22, and they listen to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. So you see, there is that anger they carry uh, that you're saying you're a Jew, you're saying you're a devout Jew, but then you have a heart for the Gentiles. What kind of a Jew are you? Okay, That angers them and they get back into that violent mode and they want to attack Paul. So, you know, they, they sort of uh, come against him with all vengeance. Verse 23, then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, you can imagine the scene. This is Jerusalem, you know, the, they dragged him out of the temple, outside the temple. All these things are going on. There's like uh, uh, an uproar. The authorities are there. The commander is there trying to rescue Paul. Okay. And uh, uh, things are just out of control. So when the people are now ready to, they were ready to kill him. But at that time, the commander, thankfully, he gives an order. He says, come on, uh, we cannot tolerate this, uh, this chaos. Uh, so, you know, you just take this man into the barracks. Okay. And uh, uh, he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. So what does the commander say? The commander is saying that uh, we are going to investigate this matter. But when we are investigating this matter, we will treat him like a criminal. Okay. So under scourging, he says, what is scourging? Scourging is like, uh, you know, they had those uh, whips, which have a metallic end. Uh, so it well, just a moment, scourges. Maybe I can show you an image. Yeah. So it, it was quite bad the way people were uh, tortured, you know, in the uh, in the custody. OK, I have an image here. It's pretty painful to look at. Uh, but you know, these are the kind of uh, difficulties uh, that Paul and even Jesus so they underwent scourging. So I'm not able to put that picture out for you. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a whip, yes. But uh, it's a very painful kind of a... Okay, let me see. Yeah, maybe this image shows it better. Are, the images are not showing. Okay, so what there's one image. All right, I'm just showing you. Yeah, can you see? Are you able to see? 
it's too tiny yeah so uh, this is a uh, scourge so it's like a whip but it used to have some metals attached to its body and the ends so when they would hit somebody with it yeah it's like it would even sort of uh, get the flesh out so it's so painful uh, the kind of treatment that jesus was subject to and now you know paul is subject to so uh, they're asking for uh, paul to be interrogated but under scourging uh, because for the commander his assumption is if the crowd is so angry with this man definitely this man must have done something right and uh, uh, he's a criminal we need to find out we need to get to the bottom of this situation um, and uh, ensure you know that that he gets the punishment that he deserves but you see at this point paul is acting very wisely and we'll stop with you know this last uh, line here so when he's going to be taken in for this whole interrogation uh, with scourging um, paul asks the centurion okay he says is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a roman and uncondemned so do you remember um, even earlier when he was in the prison he told in the uh, philippian prison he said uh, how can you uh, uh, how could you just arrest us like that you know we are we are uh, not condemned and still you put us in prison and now you're letting us go how can you just do that even now he brings up the same matter that he's a roman because in those days the romans carried uh, many rights okay special rights and uh, they could not be treated any which way so because he had that citizenship he brings that into the picture in order to you know escape from all this beating and uh, uh, sort of a very uh, cruel interrogation so we'll stop at this point and from next class we will go into all the uh, investigations so when we go into the investigations i think most probably i'll just summarize it for us so we won't need to really read through passage by passage i'll just summarize it you know he'll he'll go under different authorities and what are some of the points that he states uh, what are some of the responses of the authorities and then you know in that way we should also be able to complete our uh, remaining chapters quickly so at this point let's stop right now uh, paul has brought up this uh, matter about him being a roman citizen okay so we are going to close with a word of prayer and i uh, just want to request uh, maybe roslyn roslyn could you please lead us let's pray thank you father god thank you lord for this session that we had father god lord even as we learned even as we studied your word father god we pray and ask you daddy to help us to to grasp every word that that our dear pastor taught us father god lord we thank you we ask holy spirit to help us to to keep in our mind and to apply this to our lives in our christian walk and also to fulfill the call that is upon our lives for the extension of the, your kingdom father god lord we thank you and we bless you we thank you for all the students here father god bless each and every one of us and use us mightily for your glory in jesus mighty name we pray amen 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 thank you so much thank you roslyn thank you everyone um, god bless you and we shall connect uh, in the next class bye for now thank you